Illinois Stories is brought to you by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by the support of viewers like you. Thank you. Hello, welcome to Illinois Stories. I'm Mark McDonald and I pave a each year in September, IPAVA holds a homecoming called Camp Ellis Days. And this town of about 650 swells to maybe between two and 3,000 people who come in for a parade and other activities. Well, many people have never heard of Camp Ellis, but it had a huge impact here. This is what it's all about. Well, Marion, every year IPAVA has like a homecoming called Camp Ellis Days. And People not from around here probably can't understand what a big thing Camp Ellis was in the lives of people around Ipava, Table Grove, and this whole area. But around 1940, it pretty much overwhelmed everything, didn't it? That's really true. Uh, it uh, grew into a project that I don't think anybody realized would happen. One of the ways to point that out was that uh, where we're standing right now, if uh, you want to find 100,000 people, you have to go about 100 miles away from here to encompass 100,000 people. Uh, when Camp Ellis was here in 1943-44, all you had to do was go 10 miles and you could encompass 100,000 people. Wow. And at opening day or dedication day of the camp, uh, you could almost double that figure. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, right next to you, is a map of Camp Ellis, and it gives you a, some of the scale. Not only were there 70 or 80,000 people here at, at its height, this was like 18,000 acres. It was an immense area of land, wasn't it? It's about six and a half miles from the very west point to the very east point, about five and a half miles north to south. And this map that we're looking at, each one of the squares is a square mile, mm -hmm. 640 acres in each square mile. Wow. So you're right, there were uh, between 18 and 19,000 acres in the whole campus. Mm -hmm. now, now the government decided they needed a camp. Why? Um, that's uh, somewhat debatable in the things that I've read. <laughs> it's uh, a little hard to determine. But I believe that the, the main reason that they put this camp here was they wanted to make a training camp for engineers, and for uh, medical people, and they put a big hospital here. And I think that was the main reason that, that this camp was placed where it is. Well, they needed a big hospital if they were gonna have 80,000 people living here, didn't they? Uh, yes, uh, but the 80,000 people, that pretty much was the, the bulk of the people who were here while they trained the different phases of people that they mm -hmm. trained for the camp and the major ones being engineers and hospital people. Yeah. Uh, for people who live around here, a good comparison is that uh, this hospital was about right here, only a little over a mile away from Ipava. Ipava's here. Mm -hmm. Hospital covered 160 acres wow. right in that area. And uh, one of the comparisons that's often made is that this hospital at Camp Ellis in 1944 and 1945 was bigger than St. Francis Medical Center is now in Peoria. Wow. Uh, it was one of the largest hospitals mm -hmm. in the country at the time and one of the most advanced. You have an incredible display here on uh, exhibit here on, uh, on Camp Ellis. Let's walk back if we can because I want to see some more of it while, we have, while we're here. If we look off to our left here, this is, a, this is a new acquisition for you. They did an incredible thing. Uh, when they were uh, after they built Camp Ellis, they decided they needed a runway, but they didn't want a poor pavement, or they weren't able to. So they put down a mile-long hard strip out of this out of this iron, 150 feet wide and a mile long. And the object was they wanted to make a transfer of medical people, a, a, sur a, a group of surgery people that they could transfer from here to anywhere and do it very quickly. And to do this. They laid this runway down in 24 hours. 24 hours? Yeah. A mile long. Oh. And they tied it all together. 150 feet wide and a mile long. It's all made out of steel. And there's a picture up here on the wall uh, showing them doing that. It's right here. And there you can see it. Had several people in here that were involved with this. Uh, one man that uh, uh, was in training as an engineer, and he, he said that this is the worst day of his life. Uh, <laughs> and, he, and, and he had some tough time, hadn't yeah. he? 
uh, he had he, he later, after being trained for an engineer, he trained as a medic and uh, was in the Pacific as a medic. Mm -hmm. So he saw some pretty oh, pretty man. bad things and there. But was... on this particular day, if you look in the background of the picture, you see snow and yeah. mud. The mud looks like it's six to twelve inches deep. Yeah. They're all wearing heavy wool overcoats, oh, and uh, they once they started, they didn't stop. And they got it done in 24 hours. And uh, then they, uh, the medical people brought in three uh, C-47s and loaded them up with a surgery unit and flew them out and accomplished what they wanted to accomplish. Within a short period of time, they got wow. a medical unit transferred. I think it was to Lawrenceville that they took them. But mm -hmm. The idea was to be able to get them moved out quickly so that when they got to Europe, they could uh, move a surgical unit right up behind the lines. And, wow. and, so uh, this was like the first MASH unit, I guess, something like pretty, that, huh? Pretty much that's the way it looks to me. Uh, if uh, when you look at MASH on TV now, yeah. you can realize that that's what they started here at this hospital. Yeah. These are, these are uh, the hospital, this is the footprint of the hospital. Those buildings are gone now. Uh, but some of them were, this looks like this was some of them. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the hospital buildings. Uh, the, all of the buildings in this camp were uh, not substantial structures. They mm -hmm. were all frame built. And the hospital, instead of being one large building, was a lot of little buildings, but they were all interconnected so that you could go from any unit of the hospital uh, from one unit to another without being outdoors. Mm -hmm. uh, but still, they were separate buildings. We're going to talk more about the POW aspect of this camp because that's the one that gets everybody's attention. But that was really a small portion of what they did here. They ran the hospital. They did the medical training. They also did engineering training, which we can see over here. And I don't know how many bridges they might have built, but, it, but they, they were good at it, weren't they? Uh, they, they practice and practice and repractice. And <laughs> I, I've told people that come in here and then want to talk about Camp Ellis. Uh, some people don't realize that Camp Ellis straddled Spoon River. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the reasons for it being built where it was, because there are a lot of small rivers in Europe, and they knew they were going to have to, uh, the bridges were going to be destroyed, and they were going to have to yep. cross rivers and do it rapidly. And this is where they did the practicing to do that. And the engineers that were trained here were trained to cross the river in a hurry, and they'd take a, a uh, unit of soldiers out there and build a bridge, cross the river, get on the other side, go up about a half a mile and build another bridge and come yeah. back, tear the other one down. Uh, I would kind of guess that there, that the Spoon River was, during Camp Ellis was probably bridged several hundred times. Uh, they, until they got good at it and, yeah. they, and boy, they knew how to do and it because when they got as, to Europe, they were, they were successful. As soon they? as they got one, one unit trained at it, that unit went to Europe and they trained another unit. Mm -hmm. Marion, you've been sort of hosting Department of Defense people in this area because they've been looking for practice landmines, grenades, and stuff that would have been used at Camp Ellis in training, but may not have exploded and could possibly explode, and it's kind of scary, isn't it? They've been out there looking for any live ordinance they can find, and the, the ordinance that was used at Camp Ellis is generally pretty small. There weren't any large bombs, mm -hmm. uh, weren't many large landmines, they were all pretty small. And the, the pictures that are here are pictures of things that uh, were used out there. The picture of this landmine right here, we've got another example right over on the other wall right there of a picture that they found uh, just a couple of months ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, when they found this picture, uh, so this picture right here is the same landmine that you saw over mm -hmm. there. And this is an actual hole, and it's down by Bernadotte, the little town that was in Camp Ellis. Mm -hmm. And uh, they found that a couple of months ago, and uh, it's been more like three months ago now. And uh, they did explode it in place, and they probably will find some more. When they were here a few years ago, they found several of these mm -hmm. in the same area. They're trying to clear all of those out and trying to educate the public so that the public knows that those kinds of things are there and will recognize them and not get in trouble. So far, nobody's been in trouble. Nobody's found something that has exploded that's hurt anybody. Yeah. Dean Chenoweth, you were like seven or eight years old, and the government needs 18,000 acres in West Central Illinois to open a camp, and you happen to live on a farm in there, and they pretty much tell people, 
you got to go. Is that pretty much the way it happened? Yeah, it really is. It was uh, kind of a startling experience for the whole neighborhood. We weren't expecting anything like that at all. Yeah. You, you, your mother had seen surveyors working around the place. Everybody knew something was going on, right? We were getting uh, rural electrification out in the country, and we'd had surveyors. We assumed they were in working with the rural electrification, but um, I don't know to this day whether they were or whether they were doing the preliminary surveys on the camp. Mm -hmm. But uh, just within a few months, well, I, I think we'd had the electricity up for a week, and they almost immediately tore it down. And uh, They tore it down, why? Because they needed the poles and the wiring over in the camp area where the oh. vast amount of the troops were. They needed to electrify Camp Ellis, yeah. so you lost uh -huh. out on that one. You had yeah. electricity for one week. Yeah, we had it for a week. You must have thought you were in heaven for that week. <laughs> we thought it was pretty great. <laughs> oh, I'll bet. Oh, that's so sad. But, now, uh, you, this, is a, this is the Camp Ellis map. Point, point out where your home was there. Okay, our home, uh, I was living on my grandmother's home at the time and it was on this Hoke Hill Road, mm -hmm. and it was in this area uh -huh. where we were living at the time. My folks, where I was born, was up in this area, uh -huh. and uh, we still farmed the ground, and part of it was pasture and so yeah. forth. All, the, all those uh, hundreds of families like yours mm -hmm. were displaced and had to find property somewhere else where you could farm, so you, your family picked up and moved west of Macomb. Right. Um, we had start, well, some of the other farms had already been taken ahead of time, and we thought they were done taking, you yeah. know, so the folks had kind of quit looking. Uh, my uncle was in, their farm was in an area that they were already going to take, so he had bought a farm up uh, south of Bushnell. But uh, we hadn't really looked real serious because yeah. we didn't think it was going to yeah. come this and, far. And at that point, what the government says is, okay, this is what we're going to give you for your acres. And right. it's not a take it or leave it. This is it. You're leaving. Uh -huh. Do you remember how much per acre? It was uh, oh, $75 to $100 an acre. Oh, man. And at that time, you couldn't buy ground even at that, you know. Mm -hmm. But that was low on it. And that was with whatever improvements were on it. If there was a house and barns on it, well, that went with it. That was. And, and, and I mean, you, you either moved your house and your barn or they tore it down. Yeah. Right? They just uh -huh. bulldoze everything down. You just had to be out of there by a certain date. Yeah. Whatever you had out by a certain date, why? Uh, that's what you got. Do your did your parents ever hold a grudge against the government for this? Oh, it was tough for them to give it up, you know, because they'd lived in this area all their life. Yeah. Uh, but not with the war on. Uh, they talked mostly about the the neighbors who had young men, 17, 18 years old, you know, and what they had to give up, you know, it was. Yeah so much more viable than the land. Yeah. So uh, that's the way they rationalized it. it was, yeah. Thank you, Dean. Us boys weren't old enough that we were gonna go in it right away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks. But uh, there were so many people that uh, were looking for ground, you know, and they, um, of course a lot of them never farmed again. They couldn't find anything mm -hmm. or couldn't get it financed. Or, so uh, it was pretty tough, yeah. it was tough. John, you've done some research and writing about right. uh, uh -huh. Pava and Camp mm -hmm. Ellis. Um, and we talk about these families, these farm families that were displaced. Mm -hmm. Some of them were even displaced more than once. Right. And, and you, know, you know a story about that. Yes, the Marshall family, they had a thousand some acres. And they'd taken part of their farm and they told this family to move over across the road into their father's home mm -hmm. that they wouldn't take it. And they did. And then later they said, well, you got to move out of here right away because we need an airport, need an airstrip. Mm -hmm. And by then, most of the farms were rented or taken, and mm -hmm. so it put them in a bad situation. Yeah. So they got displaced once and, and then again. Yeah, right, uh, twice. Did they ever, were they ever able to buy any of that land back, or have you followed, been able to follow uh, their story? They did not buy any of it back. They did not. The brother bought a piece back, but mm -hmm. they were upset because when they took their land, they said they could buy it back at the same price. Well, the administration changed, and they wouldn't allow that. Is that right? Uh, so the, the price inflated after yes, the war? Yes, it inflated quite a bit. Yeah. 
Uh -huh. Oh boy. So, so if you expected, let's say they offered you hundred dollars an acre for your land and you got off and you expected to be able to purchase it back for that, it might yeah. be what, double that? when It well, might be double that oh, and then yeah. they turned it down and then at the auction it even brought more in that thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Bill Kramer, so many people are surprised to know that there was a prisoner of war camp in west central Illinois. You were a guard. Yes. You, it was your job to make sure those prisoners from Germany and Austria stayed in line. Yes. Was it tough? No, they were very, very highly educated and very well disciplined, and, and they were very glad to be in the United States of America. Really? They would tell you that? Oh, sure, yeah. Uh, they were, uh, the war for them was over, and uh, they loved America. Uh, for several reasons, but the best reason that I can recall was the food. That <laughs> <laughs> the food they were so hungry for for meat and and um, butter products. Mm -hmm. They would make sandwiches out of uh, raw chopped meat, and they would butter a piece of bread and make a sandwich out of lard, you know, mm -hmm. whole lard, mm -hmm. and they loved that. They did all our cooking, and each morning we would take them out to the project. They would um, ask us what what they would like to uh, fix us for breakfast. They did all the cooking. They ate the same rations that we did, and they received the same treatment as we did. Mm -hmm. Now you say for them the war was over. They knew they weren't going back. Right? Oh no, no, they didn't. They knew this. Yes, and, and they knew that they were going to live a pretty good life here. But they also knew that the war was going to end and they weren't going to stay in a POW camp forever. Well, they were, they, uh, they were entitled to uh, come back five years after the war was over, if they wanted to, mm -hmm. and become United States citizens. Did any of them do that? Well, not to my knowledge. Um, I uh, was only here about a year and uh, I had to uh, leave because uh, uh, I got in trouble with one, mm -hmm. and uh, I was penalized for a little while, mm -hmm. and I got in trouble with a uh, post commander also, and I was transferred to Chicago. I see. But I don't know when they left, but when I was here, there's only 1,500 of them, and they were Rummel's men from the North African campaign. Is that right? Uh, so they were serving in the desert. No wonder they wanted to come here. Oh, well, sure, huh? yeah. yeah. But, uh, you know, Field Marshal Montgomery outsmarted um, Rummel mm -hmm. in the desert, you know. Mm -hmm. He was the desert fox. Yeah, yeah. But they were, they were very well educated, and they were young. They were young, and I think that they were about uh, probably 25 to 31 years old. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and when you approached them, they stood up. Mm -hmm. And, Disciplined. Uh, oh, very much so, yeah. 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 And they always had an uh, uh, equivalent to our buck sergeants, uh, under officer they mm -hmm. call them, mm -hmm. and uh, they, he would give them orders what they had to, what we requested them to do. Mm -hmm. Well, was, thanks for the visit. Oh, well, thank you it's very, very much. Very interesting. Very uh, thank interesting. You for the, and I love your shirt. Well, <laughs> I, I have two, one of them in the other room. But uh, anyway, yeah. This is, you, this is you and your wife. This is my own, my this own design. This is you and your wife. Yes, yeah. 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 Beautiful couple. Well, thank you very much, Mark. <laughs> it's a pleasure to do the program. Well, Mary Gore, you were a bookkeeper, is that right? Yes. At Camp Ellis. And you frequently came in contact with the prisoners of war. Well, Quite often. How, how would, wh under what circumstances would you come well, in contact Well, when they, with every day they would come and bring in their coupons. They were paid. The Austrians were, not the Germans. The Austrians were paid okay. with coupons. And then they came in, and I had to count the, how, how many it had been spent. Mm -hmm. And that... So the like, Austrians were treated differently than the Germans were? Yes, they were. They cooked, but when they first came, they had to split them up because they couldn't get along. Oh, is that right? You mean that's, they would fight among themselves? Oh, yes, very definitely did. Oh, okay. So they told me, I don't know, that's yeah. what they told me. Yeah. And so that the uh, Austrians and the 
Germans were all, one on one side of the camp and one's gone on the other oh. side. Now why did the Austrians get paid and the Germans didn't get paid? Well, I don't know whether they did. I didn't have anything to do with it. Oh, them, so you just, okay, so you only cashed the coupons yes, for, the, for, the, oh, okay. for the, all right. that because no. of them, but I don't think they did, because they the Austrians were all over camp. Mm -hmm. no oh, you mean they had freedom? Free had freedom, yes, they were everywhere. Mm -hmm. But the Germans, no. No, they kept them contained. Yes. And if they were on a work detail or something, they made sure they were guarded, et cetera. Yes. But they didn't guard the Austrians. They just let them free. No. Free, free. If they were at a social function or something, there was always uh, guards there. Mm -hmm. But they didn't. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what were they like? Were they nice guys? Yes, they were. I was going to go last say that at one time we had a Chrysler. My uncle did. And I drove the Chrysler out there. and. They wanted it. They prisoners were so good, fascinated with that car, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so I took them for a ride. <laughs> Some of them. You didn't One get in the trouble, guard, did you? The guard went with me. Yeah. Okay. So you didn't get in any trouble. No. Today. <laughs> but it was so funny. And then we'd come back, and some rest of them would go and take a ride. So I said, I hope nobody catches us out of driving around camp because they didn't. They were interested in the car, not me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> did they did they speak English, the Austrians? No. No. Well, they now didn't. some of them would a bit, uh -huh. but most of them I couldn't understand. Yeah. But yeah. we'd get along. Yeah. We could make <laughs> connections there. How long were you a bookkeeper at the camp? Well, until it went out of business. Mm -hmm. So three or four years, I guess, huh? Yeah. 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 Was that a good job? Yes, it was. It was a very good job. It was not. It yeah. was a good job. Yeah. It was interesting. People were nice to get along with and everything. So. Yeah. Well, thank yes, you. We got okay. <laughs> Bill Branson, you were a youngster when Camp Ellis was operating. Um, it, it was a good age. It was a good route for you to be a paper boy, wasn't it? You were right. the right age, and it was there, and it, it, it needed work, didn't it? Sixth, seventh, and eighth grades yeah. is when I was out there yeah. know, selling papers. And yeah. you just don't think of a military camp needing a paper boy, but the guy you worked for, he brought in papers from all over the Midwest, oh, yes. I guess. Oh, huh? yes. And even some New York papers, too. Really? Yeah, he, yeah, he would... Uh, they had a system of getting them in here, and, yeah. and, uh, and we worked sometimes seven days a week because they had Sunday papers also. You, yeah. you and how many other kids would have been working out there? Well, it's, it's really hard to remember, but I'd say 10 or 12 mm -hmm. a lot of times. Because yeah. it was a small city, wasn't right. it? Right, and it, of course that was just summertime. I don't know really what, how he handled it all winter, but yeah. we, we had to go back to school, you know. Sure, so sure. We couldn't be out there. Yeah. So uh, give me an example of what a day was like. This is, a, there, here's the map of, of Camp Ellis. What was a day like for a paper boy? Well, I lived a mile south of town, so I'd get up about 4.30 and walk to town, mm -hmm. and, and we would meet at the, there was a building where the papers were assembled mm -hmm. and, and where the boys would get their, the amount they thought they would need for their route. Mm -hmm. and, uh, We'd all get in this big van and head for Camp Ellis, and we had a, we had permission to take the paper boys in, and mm -hmm. uh, and then this big van would just dump us off at our particular locations, and we were on our own to put we put papers in the mess halls, and we also carried them right to the barracks and mm -hmm. sold them individually to mm -hmm. the and uh, you know we sold a lot of papers. Do you remember the paper cost back then? Well, it was like. Fifteen cents at the mm -hmm, most, mm -hmm. I think. You know, and you, and you were trusted with the money. You were supposed oh, yeah, to bring we back had, yeah, cash we, for each paper right, that you right. had. Huh? Yeah, we yeah. had to do our own. We could turn in the ones we didn't sell. We didn't really have to sell them. Yeah. You know, we just didn't make any money yeah. off of those. You know, we talked about the impact that this camp had on the families that were displaced, which is a negative thing. But there were some positive things too, because it took a small army to build this thing, yeah, and all was, those construction workers had to stay places, didn't they? Yeah, they did. They stayed as close as they could. You know, they didn't want to commute too far, and uh, so a lot of homes had that were outside the camp were used to our uh, construction workers, and then later for the uh, officers that didn't mm -hmm. want to live on the base. Mm -hmm. So a lot of them had families, you know, and and we we mostly we had uh, lieutenants and captains, you know, not. Did not they stay the, with you and your family? They stayed in our home upstairs. We had two mm -hmm. apartments upstairs. We mm -hmm. had a big house and, and uh, converted the upstairs to two apartments. We had a stairway that let them go in and out fairly privately, you know, mm -hmm. and, and uh, so it worked out pretty well. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we had a lot of nice people, you know, that, I mean, it was really surprising how well everything went, you know, mm -hmm. for all the disruptions there were. Mm -hmm. it, it, mm -hmm. uh, it was life. 
It was yeah. war, right? It was, it was people supported the effort. Yeah. Yes, that's right. They sure did. Well, Norman Jones, in the Easley Pioneer Museum, there is an exhibit of photographs that you helped put together because your uncle, Private Bradford, took all these while he was stationed at Camp Ellis. Yes. And then you framed them yeah. for, for, the, for the exhibit. Um, and your uncle's still alive. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Did, did he ever tell stories about Camp Ellis? Did oh, he? lots of stories. <laughs> and we wrote a lot of them down and, and kept them. And he, he told us one, I remember one story, he would uh, go back to Michigan when he'd have a, a weekend pass. Mm -hmm. Working in the warehouse, trucks brought stuff in. He'd catch a ride in a truck to Galesburg, get on the train, go to Michigan for the weekend, mm -hmm. come back. And uh, he kept clothes and shoes hidden in the warehouse so he could slip them on to get on the truck to uh, go to the train. And he went to go one weekend and uh, a prisoner had stolen his clothes uh -huh. and his shoes. So he went to the prisoners and told them and they got together among themselves and uh, they brought his clothes and his shoes to him. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, who took them? And they said, that doesn't matter, we took care of it. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of cryptic, isn't it? This is, this, is a, this is very interesting stuff. Come on a little closer for me, if you would, here. He, of course, it was partially a prisoner of war camp. Yeah. And, and these, this panel here is all prisoners of war. And in fact, here, it, it, they even had a band, didn't yeah. they? Fascinating place. And they all... Uh wrote to him after they got home to Germany even. They were just also glad to be here. They were glad to be here yeah. in the States, out, yeah. of, out of the war. And uh, they got treated pretty well, I assume. Yeah. yeah. Um, and you mentioned, I think you mentioned that he worked in a warehouse? Yeah, these are all pictures he took in the warehouse. And there, there was also a lot of civilians worked in the warehouse. Mm -hmm. And these prisoners here worked in the warehouse. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, in this show, this is just everyday stuff, but it's, it's, it's so great to have all of this documented because not only do most people not even know about Camp Ellis, but if there weren't photographs taken, all they'd have is, you know, just words. They're a little know? more personal, too. It sure is, it sure is. And this is, is incredible. Did he, did he take this one, this no, panoramic no. picture? No, okay. No, this it, is just it was a... put out to the soldiers. Yeah, okay, all right. But I just thought it was interesting that guy ran all the way around. Yeah, you got a guy in this picture that, you got a guy down here that's, he, he's in this picture here, and then the camera was moving very slowly, and you find him again over here. It's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> Smart Howard. He remembered that story well. <laughs> this farm home on Highway 136 is the only frame structure left of what was Camp Ellis. All those structures that house 70 to 80,000 people were either auctioned and sold or torn down. With another Illinois story near Ipava, I'm Mark McDonald. Thanks for watching. Illinois Stories is brought to you by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by the support of viewers like you. Thank you. For a DVD copy of the program you've just seen, send 1995 to Network Knowledge, P.O. Box 6248, Springfield, Illinois 62708. Be sure to include the program name, subject, and when the program aired. You can also order with your credit card by calling 800-232-3605.